So we are in line. So. Okay, we're at um, 504. I think we should get started. Uh, Nafisa, I'm just uh, trying to see. Yeah. Uh, she's texted in the group. She said she's joining. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe, um, maybe we can get started uh, with uh, uh, any uh, general housekeeping questions <laughs> and also those questions that are addressed to me. So. Hey, welcome uh, everyone, and uh, this is uh, Zoom week four of our course. I hope you've been enjoying it and learning. I know some of it is pretty hard, uh, tough going. Uh, lots of details, lots of uh, jargon as well. Uh, lots of things to uh, uh, think about and remember. Uh, also, I uh, hope you'll be able to do weekly assignments. Um, uh, there's uh, something some number that you have to do uh, if you want to uh, go ahead and get the certification for the um, uh, for the course. But uh, more importantly than all that, of course, is the learning. So I hope that's that's happening. And uh, uh, we're here, of course, to um, uh, help you answer questions and so on. So I'm going to first take a look at the, um, the spreadsheet where uh, some questions have come in for uh, for Benjamin and me. Um, Actually, I'm not quite sure to answer this. So one uh, question I think is, um, it's not clear who it's uh, related to, but Mother Nas uh, says he, um, uh, he's interested in about, about tech tools, bird nature conservation, biostatistics, software, biometrics, design and development, and so on. I think that's a very broad uh, kind of uh, list of things that we have to learn about. So I think if you're here, maybe you can... Uh, type in the ch checkbox and be a little more specific. Obviously, there's tech, uh, whether it's hardware or software uh, involved in a whole number of uh, topics related to bird research. Uh, obviously, technology uh, impacts our lives and our research in various, various ways. So if there's anything specific you'd like us to ask in the chat box. Um, I move to another one uh, by Gajanan, um, and which order of modern birds is considered most printed and most advanced and why. So then I'm afraid um, uh, this question is actually best directed to uh, Dr. Jaipal. Um, uh, he's the one I think who uh, uh, did the lectures on uh, systematics and that's on and so on. So perhaps you can ask that question in the in the Google discussion group, which you can get to or when you click on ask the question on the dashboard on the course, course dashboard. It's not something that I would have to uh, to answer. And um, I think I'm missing another question. Uh, it's been replaced by something else. In any case, if you have questions, please do uh, type them in the chat box. I see Mandir is also here. So uh, both of us are available to answer your questions uh, related to this week's uh, uh, subject, this week's lectures. 
uh, you can ask for about other mix, but we may not we may not uh, feel uh, able to answer them. And I'll say you can always ask questions in the uh, Google discussion group. You could also, if you wanted, ask if there are more general questions about the course and how it's structured and what they use and so on for getting X percentage and getting a certificate. You could ask them again. Now uh, we need to refer that to somebody else who knows the details of that. So uh, that's all the questions that have come in, in the uh, Google Sheet if you uh, through the form that some of you have submitted. Uh, so if you'd like to ask uh, type questions in the chat box, please do so. Manjari, if you did you want to add anything about your lectures or anything for you to say? Hi, hi, Sohil. So I'm just trying to get access to the Google Sheet. Uh, it's fine, Manjari. There are just three points there. I've I've just uh, read them out, so there's nothing much on the Google Sheet. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, um, if anybody has any questions about the lecture, was it okay? Was it clear to everyone? It's Friday evening. Everybody is prepared for the weekend, I think. I think someone is saying something. Jayesh, you do you have a question? So, yeah, as long as you can tell, the lectures that we are uh, delivering are really uh, about uh, how one might think about different aspects of birds, whether it's their evolution or their physiology or their behavior. And also, as you saw from my lectures this week, uh, it's also, you know, some, some applications about how one might uh, design studies, what some best practices are in the design of the studies. And before that, of course, how you ask questions. Um, how you phrase your questions, what the motivation is going to be very clear about those. Because obviously you have a broad idea of what motivates you, but then you want to do the actual research, you have to narrow that down considerably uh, into something very specific. Um, I think there's a question here, sir, I suppose, yeah. addressed to me. Uh, so kleptoparasitism and bioparasitism are two different things. Uh, Manjali, I think you uh, spoke about kleptoparasitism in your uh, lecture. So, bioparasitism is where uh, uh, a species parasitizes the parental care of another species by, in case of birds, laying eggs in the nest of another species and leaving those eggs and subsequent chicks for the parents of uh, the other, the host parents to raise. Thereby, the parasitic uh, parent is free from the um, effort of raising um, her own young. And it's a very large effort in birds. Uh, the effort of feeding chicks and caring for them uh, is a massive uh, energy uh, investment and is meant to, in fact, reduce the chance of survival of uh, parents to the next year, reduce their overall lifespan, their condition uh, that is not able to bear, and so on. And so uh, some species have hit upon this uh, trick of uh, using other species to uh, raise their young. So that's brain parasitism. Manji, if you want to say something about kleptoparasitism. Yeah, I, I was first, I just wanted to know that uh, the assignment must be already up, no, Nafisa, for this chapter. Uh, for yeah, this, the uh, assignments already up. Yeah, so I had asked a question. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's like then giving the answer to the question. <laughs> okay. So that's okay. I, I don't know whether I should do that. Maybe... Uh, if you can write it in the discussion forum and after the assignments are submitted, maybe I'll get back, uh, circle back to it because uh, I have already explained both of this in the lecture. So I would really want you to listen to the lecture again if it is not clear because it's an assignment question. Right, Nafisa? I think uh, all yeah. the questions I have submitted have been uploaded, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, they've all been uploaded. So... Yeah, I don't know whether I should I answer that or Suhail. I don't know. No, if it's an assignment, it's an assignment so. better than Nigeria, right? Uh, there's a question from Gajanan. Solutions to assignment three is released before the due date, but questions are different from that in the assignment. Uh, this is something I'm not sure about. Maybe there's something Nafisa you could look into and uh, yeah, yeah, I'll check and it. One separately on the forum, perhaps. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So questions that you there was also uh, uh, sorry, you remember for the assignment three, the uh, the correct answer when you tested some things, it was not yeah, yeah. coming as what I had given. So maybe it has got something to do with that configuration. That's why. Yeah. yeah. Some, just something has changed. Yeah. 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 Although that checking was done before the assignment was published, Vanjiri. Uh, uh, yeah. So it should not be a different, but uh, this is something we have to investigate a little bit. Andrew. Um, Nafisa, yeah, if you actually that's a good idea. There's some questions yeah. in the discussion forum that would be useful. Uh, yeah, I'll just paste some of them. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, this is a very nice question, actually. Uh, so the question is that why is cooperative breeding not so common in colder climates where survival conditions are even more harsh? Um, so basically, um, uh, as mentioned in the lecture itself, there can be multiple drivers of cooperative breeding and no one particular driver has been... Um, shown as the one driving force for cooperation. So resource uh, being a limitation or the climate being very harsh or that it is present in certain kinds of geographical location, these were proposed, but none of these actually hold. So there is no such general trend with respect to, um, you know, uh, cooperative breeders being from particular kind of climatic areas or from particular geographical locations, although Many cooperative breeders are such who are found in uh, areas where uh, there is harsh or uh, resource limited conditions, harsh climate or resource limited condition, but that is not the common, uh, it's not something that has been unequivocally shown as the driver of cooperative breeding. Then, of course, they proposed the idea of kin selection driving cooperative breeding. Um, uh, various other things, reciprocal altruism, so on and so forth. So there are multiple hypotheses for different systems, different things will work. But why isn't there cooperative uh, breeding in cold climates? Uh, well, it's not as though there aren't uh, uh, cooperative breeders in cold climate. For instance, the Siberian Jays and a very long term ecological study has been carried out on the Siberian Jays and we know that uh, they actually inhabit very cold conditions. In fact, if you have to collect data, you have to ski, cross-country skiing you have to do to collect data. So it is not that they aren't fine there. It's just that it is no common trend that it will be a very harsh climate or it will be always uh, kin selection driving it. So no one single uh, uh, driver of cooperative breeding has been uh, shown and it is it doesn't exist. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Well, there's another couple of questions for you. You want to take those and then I can look at uh, the one for me. Okay. Uh, can you elaborate on phenotypic assemblages and its relationship between uh, flock sizes? Okay. So basically, this probably is from the mixed species flock uh, portion of my lecture. So basically, what we were trying to um, address is um, these mixed species flocks how are they formed and also asking who are they formed of? So basically seeing uh, who are the constituent species in this mixed species flock and what uh, uh, Hari Sridhar and uh, Preeti Bangal's uh, work shows is that there are different kinds of uh, 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 bird species belonging to different gills that are present in the mixed species flock and these are well heterospecific bird groups. Uh, where multiple uh, species are uh, foraging together. But then the question was that are there certain kinds of um, patterns in this uh, mixed species flock? For instance, are there certain species for 
based on the size of the bird itself or is it the behavior of the bird which may be driving the formation of these hunting parties and these have been examined uh, looking at social information benefits using direct uh, 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 either social information benefit or using direct uh, uh, grouping benefit okay so these things have been uh, examined and um, of course in the first case uh, for social information benefits you know when you have large flock size then you have lot of um, um, you have different kinds of uh, uh, there is something called the many eyes hypothesis so you have greater vigilance so you are getting information about a predator uh, because they you are present with many other kinds of birds okay so in relation to the flock size that is one thing but there is an indirect benefit of flock size in this mixed species flocks which is not the information that they gain but the very fact that they are amongst many other uh, individuals and their um, their own predation risk goes down significantly so that is the two things that i wanted to um, sort of um, highlight in the mixed species flock apart from that of course there is a nuclear species uh, so who acts as the catalyst so on and so forth so that is a um, other thing uh, in which who initiates the flock uh, and who plays the uh, main role in flock maintenance that has been investigated where people have found that both in sri lankan as well as uh, indian mixed species flocks in the western ghats the racket tail drongo or the two different um, uh, types are the ones who are initiating this mixed species flocks and they are known to be mm. vocal mimics what is not known however is exactly what role does the vocal mimicry plays is that what uh, causes the mixed species flocks to form and that is what is currently being investigated by another researcher from india what is null model approach uh, so hail i think it's for you null model approach Uh, and, uh, well, I'm not sure because I didn't talk about it in the morning, and I don't think at this stage it's uh, it's a bit too advanced to mention right now. So uh, maybe somebody else talk about the model, but I didn't. Okay, but in any case, I can. Uh... i i don't know did i speak about null model i don't remember but uh, in any case what a null model does is to when we are um, doing some kind of a comparison between what is expected if everything is equal okay versus what we actually observe so you have to compare what you find uh, whatever data you have observed you have to compare it with what we call as a null model in which the null model basically assumes for instance the uh, probability of a bunch of events say for instance you are testing for five different kinds of events to occur so the null model will say each one has the equal probability or you know you use a binomial or a poisson i don't know if i should tell about that right now but basically it just compares something with what we call as a control so the null model is some sort of a control if you like with which we compare what we have actually observed so that uh i don't know in what context this was said but if someone can tell me then i can elaborate further then uh it has been under uh, just a moment yeah so the white fronted beater uh um mm, part that i thought about it is not that these are solitary okay so there can be helpers what basically uh, was examined in the white fronted beaters is basically to see whether um helpers actually enhance survival and um, whether uh, it is useful for the helpers to stay back and they are not solitary they range from being solitary nesting so which means nuclear families two large colonial nesters so this entire spectrum exists it is not that they are a solitary species and it's not like from being solitary they have gradually in their lifetime changed to become uh, cooperative so that if that is the uh, somehow you got that from the lecture that is definitely not the case this entire spectrum exists so then makes a very good model system to ask as compared to pairs who have no helpers 
versus those who have helpers which one uh, does better what is the advantage of cooperative bidding so that is exactly what was being tested and this is where the ecological constraint hypothesis emblems ecological constraint hypothesis and all of that is there i hope that is clear the first successful bidding cannot be called cooperative yes of course so um, even amongst truly uh, obligate uh, cooperative breeders it is always possible and it happens all the time that one individual or a coalition we call it a coalition they may split from the group and they may establish their own uh, you know uh, breeding so for which they need to have access to territory and that was a point that was being made that access to territories which are good enough to raise your own young is an ecological constraint so if that ecological constraint is lifted we expect dispersal but if that ecological constraint is there then we expect dispersal to be delayed so staying back as per emlens ecological constraint hypothesis is a consequence of the constraints of resources and territory being a resource so when they if they have access to the territory and say for instance resources are abundant imagine that uh, it's in a habitat where during the breeding there is a fixed breeding season and during the fixed breeding season there is resource abundance then a solitary pair is uh, uh, can raise their chicks on their own and having a helper is not necessarily going to increase their fitness in fact one of the things which uh, researchers do try to test but empirical evidence is not very good in the uh, in this field is how many helpers is necessary and sufficient because after a point having more helpers is not going to increase uh, you know the uh, likelihood of uh, higher fitness so this is something that even we are testing we are asking whether you know having very large group sizes is actually um, correlated with increased fledgling success or increased uh, fitness let's say So yeah, I just I hope that is uh, addressed. And if there is further questions, please feel free to ask me. Uh, I'll go to the next question. okay so the question is in case of uh, uh, species or individuals or pairs that are found in captive condition but in conditions where their uh, basic uh, needs are taken care of for instance predation risk is much lower and uh, food availability is not a problem uh, is it going to result in more clutches over their lifetime so uh, in fact that is the whole point of zoos especially for rare birds and rare animals that when in the wild they are not being able to have enough offspring then you do captive breeding and so definitely it is expected that the fitness is going to be higher but then the per, uh, the uh, person goes on to ask do they need to produce more clutches over their lifetime to or become unfit in some ways due to captivity so i don't they don't need to produce more uh, clutches okay uh, they will produce more clutch uh, in the sense they will have higher success of their um, young ones simply because the constraint of resource is lifted and predation risk is much much lower maybe negligible but there are going to be other kinds of constraints there are other kinds of constraints for instance infection is one constraint uh, being able to select a mate is a very important constraint so you know maybe in a zoo you will not have as many the bird may not have as many options to select a mate from so that is the other kind of constraint that can happen ah uh -huh. so uh, not only wetland birds many uh, uh, birds that are found uh, uh, i mean even uh, terrestrial birds found 
well, in areas that are more or less deserts, they also have these colonial nesting patterns. But many seabirds, for instance, have this uh, colonial uh, uh, nesting patterns where there are large colonies in which they breed. And the idea behind breeding in very large colonies, one, of course, is their safety in numbers. So this has been shown, these were Tim Burgeon's classic experiments where he sh showed that, you know, the chance of predation by crows for a particular species of gulls, I think black-headed gulls, is much lower when the nesting happens closer or inside the main colony as opposed to when the nests are further away from the uh, colony, uh, simply because there is more mobbing of the predator by many individuals and also there's more spotting of the predator by many individuals. So it is definitely a very big advantage. Uh, Telangana 436 birds. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. That's fantastic to know that you can, I, I, I think you mean you can identify so many birds. That's great. Uh, thanks, Manjali. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So I think there's one uh, question from me by Gaurav, which is about uh, statistical validation of repeated experiments. So um, see, the Ram monkeys. That's that's a specific thing. So that that example was about how you know this adage about correlation does not imply causation. Uh, what the reason that is. So. Yeah, yeah. If you uh, in your study you intend to uncover causation, cause and effect, then you have to be very careful, and you have to design your study very carefully. I will be using an experimental approach where you manipulate, that is, you change under your control the supposed causal variable and see if the outcome variable changes accordingly. So, um, so, so for example, uh, and, and I think a larger point is, you know, we often in any study we would perhaps do multiple. Uh, reputations on multiple studies to find out the answer to our question. I think that's absolutely right. So, for example, you might start with an observation of a correlation. You might go out and observe this thing that I showed in the in the lecture about monkey uh, prevalence being related to where uh, the primatologist goes, and then uh, you might get an idea from that correlation about what the causal effects might be. So you start out with an observation study, just observing the pattern, and then you might follow it up with an experimental study where uh, you uh, change the supposed cause and let's see what the outcome is. So very often that might happen. A study may be in multiple parts, one observational and perhaps one experimental. Um, you might repeat an experiment when you, when you say repeated experiments. Yeah, I mean, uh, you could repeat an experiment for multiple reasons. One is uh, if uh, something goes wrong, and many things can go wrong in the experiment, uh, because you want to isolate, for a, as you know, isolate the, uh, uh, the cause of the and uh, change only that, and try and ensure that nothing else is different except that cause of the uh, between the uh, treatment and the controls, or the different uh, groups that you are comparing. But various things may happen that can contaminate that, in which case your experiment is kind of ruined, and you have to repeat the experiment. You might want to repeat the experiment for other reasons, not just because it's got its pilot. You might want to repeat the experiment under different conditions to see if the same results come about even under different experimental conditions. Uh, and this is something we really care about we to uh, find general patterns about the world, not necessarily only those patterns, those things that happen under very specific circumstances. And for, of course, uh, it's important to repeat studies and repeat experiments because we don't generate broad knowledge through single studies. A single study may provide a hint or, or point the way, but the only um, uh, you know the trust we have in a particular outcome if is if multiple studies have looked at a similar question and repeatedly come up with similar results. So by the aggregation of a large number of studies, what I call synthesis in in the lecture, through that synthesis is how we come up with general statements about the world. Single studies uh, can really provide a hint. They need to be corroborated or supported or repeated in multiple studies. So I don't know if I interpreted the question quite right, but that's my um, that's my understanding and my response. Uh, Manjali, again, back to you. I think you've got another question about helpers. Yeah, it's a very nice question. 
I am very pleased to have this. Uh, short answer is I don't know fully, but we know that first of all, immediate rewards for helping as such by feeding the helpers that is not there in the cooperative breeding system. The question being, why join a group and delay your uh, reproduction? So that is driven by those various, at the very end, I told multiple hypotheses, no? or reciprocal altruism, ecological constraint, kin selection, etc. So that is what, but it's not as though uh, they will be rewarded immediately. But one of the important drivers uh, for cooperative uh, breeding is uh, they stay back to join the reproductive queue. And for the same reason, breeding or competition for breeding spots or competition for breeding itself where helpers start to breed is one major cause for eviction uh, for helpers from the group. The second thing that you have said that if the birds don't help, are they going to be thrown out from the group at, the some, uh, at some time? Yes, absolutely. Yes, that does happen. But in systems where there is the pay to stay kind of a model. And typically, uh, this is also uh, more likely to happen when the helpers are unrelated. So this uh, this can happen, definitely. Have any instances of sibling rivalry seen? Uh, so I am guessing you mean uh, between the chicks? That is common irrespective of whether they are cooperative breeders or not. So sibling rivalry with respect to... It's there even in plants. So we know that. But if you mean sibling rivalry among between uh, helpers uh, and things like that, probably uh, no, not not in that sense. Uh, but there is definitely competition for reproductive uh, uh, queue and going higher into the reproductive queue. So that kind of rivalry is there. I hope I have answered the question. Um, I see that Saiti has written, uh, okay, that's great. Saiti, welcome uh, to this course. It is uh, for slightly older uh, people, but uh, welcome. I hope uh, you are enjoying it and learning. Uh, Dilip uh, Jamnagar, what's the reason for death? Uh, hard to say. Many uh, uh, birds on migration and passage migration uh, die through collision with uh, some obstacle. Uh, very often, uh, glass or windows, uh, or sometimes it might be if there are no windows, but it's hard to know. Uh, if there's no visual mark, it's likely some kind of uh, blunt trauma. So some kind of collision is most likely. Um, or maybe exhaustion, Suhail? Can it be exhaustion? I, I guess it could be. Uh, but, um, yeah. We, we don't, yeah, it's possible one of the things may happen. We tend to find uh, birds dead mostly through collision. But if it is just somewhere out in the open, there's no other reason that it's quite, it's possible. And a bird is a passage migration, but uh, passage migration is over a longer period of time, Dilip. I think, uh, I mean, I can't remember specifically for this species, but uh, um, it happens over a period of time. And so there will be early birds that pass through and there will be late ones that uh, pass through later. Uh, so with, uh, I'll have to look into it to to see. I'm sure Dilip, you are in touch with the bird watching community in Gujarat, uh, and uh, we will be able to uh, look. And if you look on bird, for example, the public platform, you can see what the kind of uh, range of uh, passage migration dates there are. Yes, we uh, always uh, observe that uh, it is only uh, seen in September. Uh, first week of the October, never seen. Uh, such bird. I see. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's uh, unusual if you are saying that the you know there's such a narrow passage migration time. Uh, in this in this particular area, Kutch or Jamnagar, it's only a September. Eurasian. Just looking at it, it uh, I see uh, spanning from middle of August to uh, first week of October. So um, yeah. I mean, important for you to report it and to, um, you know, for to enter the, the how do you say, the assembly rec record that is that, you know, people know about it, that there's a later specimen as well. Um, I don't see any more questions. I mean, since we mentioned uh, something about you know, this uh, timing of migration and uh, 
how you can look at these things using public participation, like on the eBot platform. I, I'm, I'm sure all of you know, but I just mentioned that today is the first day of the Great Backyard Bed Count, which is a global watching event for the event in February, every February, where bird watchers uh, all over the world go out and spend uh, uh, time outdoors and list and count all the species they see and hear, and then upload uh, them through uh, this, this, these counts, these lists to the uh, platform, the digital platform, either on the website or the app. Uh, so, uh, India has been you know, part of this ever since 2013, and we have consistently the second or third position in terms of participation in species. Of course, we are very large. We are among the most species diverse country. I think we are seventh or eighth uh, among all countries in terms of species we have. Most of the ones at the top are South American countries, and there's even Asia ahead of us. And we are neck to neck with China in the number of species. So, in any case, but we have large numbers of birds all over the country, every single state and territory uh, who take part. So, uh, do take part. Maybe somebody can put a, a link uh, in the chat box so where people can learn more. There's still three weeks to left uh, to go. Uh, there's uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday for the, uh, the count. And uh, what's more interesting is that uh, more interesting for this count is India, we run alongside the Great Backyard Bird Count, we run the campus bird counts where uh, around 200 education and other campuses take part every year. Uh, so college campuses, university campuses, research campuses, corporate campuses, all kinds of different or military campuses to, uh, take part. And um, it's great fun because it's, there's a friendly competition between the different campuses. Uh, and there are two campuses from Uttarakhand that usually come out on top. Uh, so it's uh, nice to give them a bit of a fight uh, in terms of number of species. And effort, of course, is different. Effort is under our control, number of species is not under our control. So if you know about it, do uh, take a look. I'll put a link over here uh, before the end of the session. Uh, Manjit, do you want to unmute and answer that question? Yeah, yeah I think somebody wants uh, the paper, uh, Tin Virgin's paper. I will mm -hmm. share that. It is on... Uh, Mobbing by crows. I'll share that. Hmm? Or should I send it right away? Can I send the PDF to the TS? Is that okay? Yeah, I think so. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, Nafisa, if it's an uh, openly available paper, you can put it on the forum as well. I also want to ask everybody, uh, did you get an email reminder about this live session? Because I, I don't remember getting it. Uh, maybe you can put your thumb, maybe your thumbs up if you did get the email reminder, the automatic reminder from MPTEL. Uh, did anybody get the reminder about this session? Hmm. Not by email. I see something. You got a uh, text received it yesterday. Gajana, go to BNHS. Please go to BNHS.org. I think is the uh, just Google it and then you can find the website and uh, uh, Saiti, thanks. Uh, we, uh, this session is actually to answer questions about the uh, lecture material. Uh, so I'm afraid that. Uh, telling us about the four, three, 37 birds you've seen is uh, outside our scope a little bit. Um, if you are, Saiti, did you say you are in uh, Andhra, Telangana? Kamaredi district, which is in Telangana, is that right? Uh, there's uh, should be a group of uh, birds in Telangana, and you should be able to interact with them. Um, you can drop a line to Rebecca uh, Nafisa and we'll um, send you some contact information. Uh, for you to get in touch with. Okay, thanks uh, to those of us, a mixture of people who got uh, the notification. That's yes. fine. 
ऑप्टिमल क्लच साइज and if anything more than optimal will result in less or more chicks surviving probability at best so uh, sibling rivalry as a driver of optimal class size is uh, in my knowledge i don't think that kind of uh, work has been done but i have to check i don't think that is there but uh, definitely sibling rivalry resulting in uh, the death of uh, some individuals uh is definitely uh, that data is definitely there there uh, is is there but whether it's an evolutionary driver of clutch size that i don't know if any evolutionary studies has been carried out behavioral and be uh, behavioral ecological studies are there are tons of studies which show that sibling rivalry can result in death of uh, individuals in the nest and that if you want i can share some papers with you okay uh, gorav is that something so the answer to your second question is yes it can uh, re result in less number of chicks surviving but is that driving the optimal clutch size that i don't know if anybody has looked at that from an evolutionary perspective okay. yeah so he named them yeah i think the only um, other uh, question was about the live interaction recordings disha um, on the if you go to the course uh, dashboard on epitel on the left side there's a week a week uh, a week, a week calendar a week, a week kind of uh, menu and if you click on the random uh, week you will see both the videos the pre recorded videos that the faculty have um, prepared and once the live recording uh, is done for these interactions i believe that there's a link also to those live recordings placed there under the relevant week uh devika or nafisa can you confirm if that's true uh all, all the interactive sessions are available at the dashboard yeah just on the left side under the relevant week Manjali, just checking if you've seen. There's a couple of questions I think for you in the chat box. I don't know why they would kill their own chicks, but just wild guess. Uh, resource limited conditions. Um, so maybe I don't know. cannibalism i am not sure professor urfi from delhi university might be the best person to answer this but i don't know the answer to this so so hel would you want to guess or uh i'm not quite sure majri but i think it's uh, it's a fairly common occurrence in number of species where uh, chicks that are uh, the right of the the breed the ones that aren't growing fast and uh, don't seem to be keeping up with the rest of the chicks in species where the siblings don't attack them and kill them sometimes you you tend to see parents uh, kind of eating the chick or something like the smallest chick yeah so cannibalism uh, yeah uh, presumably but why why do that uh, will it only be in resource limited conditions or it doesn't matter yeah i i guess it happens most of the resource limited conditions but uh, wherever there's hatching is simple where the chicks don't hatch at the same time you get a, a range of uh, of uh, sizes because there are hatch chicks they get to start and the last has chicks uh, uh, tend to lag behind and even when resources are plenty sometimes you get this because it's not because of lack of resources but because the la largest chicks because they're larger they bigger gates they're able to bite more loudly We tend to get the most food, so the parents seem to not be aware of uh, yeah. food evenly. So sometimes in queens, for example, even with good resources, 
uh, pretty much the last hatched uh, one or two crow chicks or dies pretty much always. So, um, yeah. I'm wondering why so many questions on sibling rivalry. I didn't teach anything about it, but nonetheless, it's uh, yeah. I don't mind taking it. Uh, is it a way? Is in a way decreasing their parents' own gene pool and wasting all the care? Okay. Yeah, it is uh, well paradoxical, but uh, my best guess is cannibalism under resource limited environment. If it is actually, uh, uh. Sorry, not sibling rivalry. Killing, killing your own chicks would be cannibalism under resource limited environment. But sibling rivalry as a way to increase. Uh, uh, yeah, that I don't understand your question. Actually, you've asked that sibling rivalry is in a way decreasing their parents' own gene pool. So wasting all the care. But you know the whole point. I mean, that's. So we ask, that what is the unit of selection? The unit of selection. Is it the individual or is it the species or the group or the species are you doing it for the good of your species the good of your parents so the point is that that sibling that individual is trying to maximize its own uh, uh, chance of survival and that is what drives sibling rivalry so it is not paradox sibling rivalry per se is not paradoxical at all and uh, so even if it causes reduction of the parents uh, gene pool it doesn't matter it improves its chance of survival so it is explained simply by competition uh, on the other hand why would the parent kill its own chick that is somewhat paradoxical but like Suhail said asynchrony can be something that can lead to this but uh, mostly I would imagine cannibalism would happen when there is a resource limited environment Madam, please, madam, I want to tell 436 Telangana birds. Yeah, okay, uh, Sahiti, maybe you can email me. Would you, is that okay with you? Can you email me the list? I would be very interested in knowing that, yeah? Because right now, you narrating 436 birds is not really okay. But you please email it to me and I think we will be very, I will be very interested to know, yeah? Is that okay with you? Okay, madam, but I Thank will you. tell. Madam? No, you will not. Okay. So I think we are, Anjali, we are getting, uh, I don't know if you spoke about imprinting, but we are getting some, <laughs> some rivalry somehow. You are not speaking about it, isn't it, uh, Anjali? So it's, uh, it's coming out of some, from somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, but that's okay. I'm happy to discuss yeah, because yeah. it is related to. Uh, so uh, let me just read one second. So there is one question, uh, what if the parents notice sign of in, signs of infection? Absolutely, yes, that is definitely one reason why uh, uh, many uh, animals, not just birds, they can, uh, uh, you know, throw group members out, their own chicks. If one is infected, you would want to reduce a disease transmission. So definitely that is possible. Uh, Uh, imprinting phenomena occurs in all birds or in specific groups of birds so actually I don't know the answer but I think imprinting has been shown mostly in precocial birds but uh, that is simply because uh, uh, the developmental biology of precocial birds is very different and uh, they imprint uh, at a very young age but then again, different forms of imprinting is likely to be present uh, in many different species of birds. But the classic uh, imprinting experiment by Conrad Lawrence were in precocial birds, as you know it. Um, yeah, I have Bala. I, somebody asked this question already. So I am assuming it could be because... Uh, in resource limited environment, uh, you would, I mean, if, if it has consumed the chick and not just killed it, if it has killed it and thrown it out to the nest, then probably, you know, it is diseased or something. But this is just my guesswork. I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. Yeah, thanks, Manjari. Mm -hmm. And just to remind everybody, precautional species are those which uh, are able to uh, run around and um, forage on their own uh, very shortly after hatching. 
know, compared with the altricial uh, species, which are in the nest for a long time, they tend to hatch uh, without feathers. It takes time for them to become independent. And so because precaution species uh, need to follow their um, uh, their parents or often embedded around, they need to print on who it is they should follow around. And if they follow them, a species or wrong entity around them, that will be quite catastrophic. Whereas artificial birds are stuck in the nest, they don't, they're not going anywhere anyway. So I think you can send your, uh, I think uh, Devika sent an ornithology uh, email contact. If you can send your query there, we can pass it on. Sir, I didn't My understand. email should be Sahiti. My email should be there somewhere on the web. Um, uh, so I, don't it will be there, the, no? I don't think it's on the course. Uh, uh, that I think in my lecture towards the end, I think I've given no. the contact. Yeah. So you can email. Otherwise, you just search for Manjari Jain. Hopefully, it will pop up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Otherwise, next uh, interaction again, I will be there. So you can ask me my email ID then. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Maybe um, we can begin to draw this to an end. Oh, okay. More questions coming. Maybe I'll take this one as the last one, perhaps. Uh, Gaurav's question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I guess I did uh, um, advise generally that when we uh, look for uh, research topics, we should be motivated by uh, the uh, by the question that is, you know, I, oh, I'm fascinated by the I want to learn something about sibling rivalry or whatever that is. Uh, or I'm fascinated by conservation and I feel deeply about it and I want to understand, you know, what is causing the decline of this particular species because it has that application in conservation. Now, what sometimes people do is uh, saying, well, I've trained uh, in, uh, in some technique, some uh, which could be, a, it could be a software technique like GIS or uh, Species distribution modeling, if you know what that is, or it could be uh, a lab technique, like you know, I I know something about uh, molecular uh, uh, markers, and I can run PCRs, and I know microsatellites or whatever else. And say, so, okay, I start with the technique and say, what questions can I answer using this this technique? So my uh, my suggestion is that ideally we should be uh, driven by and governed by the question rather than the tools that we have in our toolbox. And uh, in order to answer the question, if there are tools that we need, then we either learn them ourselves or we collaborate with others who know those tools and can uh, apply those tools. Uh, remember, it's not necessary that you should be able to do every single thing, especially if we are talking about very specialized tools. Uh, but I realize that sometimes, uh, you know, people do approach it in the other way. Uh, when we say, I have this tool, and let me find a question that can be answered using this tool. Um, I mean, I don't know too much as well about it. It's fine. Uh, you know, I think the, the basic uh, point is that uh, remember that there are different ways of approaching this, different uh, um, trajectories, directions through which you can find the research question. Uh, ultimately, the research question needs to be interesting and meaningful to you. It shouldn't be only the tool that's interesting and meaningful to you. So even if you, if you are starting with the tool that you know, you should still spend the time and find the research question that is interesting and meaningful. Uh, don't uh, be governed entirely by the tools that you have in your toolkit. Uh, that's my suggestion, but people can differ on this, obviously, and it isn't some great uh, thing or anything in the world of science. Manjali, you're smiling. Do you want to add to that? No, absolutely. I totally agree with Sohil that uh, uh, is the question. Uh, which is uh, usually what we should keep in mind. Uh, but oftentimes you can also uh, chuck out questions or rather weed out questions that you cannot answer given the tools that you may may not have. So the tool is only a means to an end. So I agree with Sohil. I think it's also a philosophical thing from the perspective of, you know, what is your motivation for your endeavor in science. So tool development itself is more uh, like it is powered by science, but it's also more technology, I would say. But the use of tool should be towards addressing a question in science. 
Great. Thanks, Manjiri. I'm always a bit nervous when I say this and I don't think I'll say anything. <laughs> yeah, no, it is a trade-off. Uh, I am like... very happy to hear it, Suhail. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm very happy to hear this. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, no, it is a trade-off. You are absolutely right. And the thing is, as uh, something becomes more specialized, the tools become more specialized and more advanced. It does take significant time and effort to learn the tools, whether it's computational tools or lab tools or whatever else. Uh, it does take. So I, I agree with you. Uh, uh, thank you, Archana. I've forgotten what uh, how to do ecology. I need to look at it. Is it, uh, is it something that I have put together or is somebody else's? I'm not sure. But uh, thanks for this. Thank you all for the uh, the session today. And uh, all the best again. And see you. I'll see you in week seven, I think. And Manjali maybe sooner than that. Yeah. So uh, good. Good to see you, Sohail Nafisa. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Sivika. So thanks, everybody. Thanks yeah. to everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.